So hello everyone, welcome to the launch of Relink.org's webinar series, Addressing Addiction as a Faith Community. My name is Bethany Friedrichsen and I'm the statewide coordinator for Relink.org. Relink.org is a faith-based nonprofit statewide organization based out of Northeast Ohio. We started in 2017 with the desire to use technology to connect those in need to um, addiction resources within their communities. Over the past three years, we've worked to develop a statewide online resource tool that allows those searching to have instant access to over 64 different service categories and over 7,000 organizations across the continuum of care. This tool also serves those in reentry and human trafficking um, when they're in need of services. Uh, beyond our search tool, Relink.org makes a huge effort to constantly be involved with the community through outreach and education um, like this opportunity today. So today I will be helping facilitate the webinar. Um, if anyone has any issues, please message me directly through the chat or email me at bfriedrickson at Relink.org, which I'll type my email in the chat so you'll have that. Um, just a couple housekeeping items. We are so excited. We have about 300 registrants for today's webinar, representing over 50 of, Ohio 80, of Ohio's 88 counties and a diverse set of backgrounds from CEOs to foster parents, clinicians, and pastors. With so many joining us, we want to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. When you join the webinar, you're on mute. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the chat box. I'll be monitoring the questions as we go along to ask um, during the Q&A at the end or throughout if appropriate. With so many on this call, we may not be able to get to everyone's questions. However, we will send any remaining questions to our presenters to follow up with answers afterwards. This webinar is set to be about an hour long. Please stick around till the end. We will have some important announcements of how to access follow-up materials. If you must jump off early, it's okay. We will send out a follow-up email later this week with everything you should need. Um, so without further ado, I will pass things off to our executive director, Barbara Campbell, who will introduce today's webinar speakers. Good morning, everybody, and a huge thank you to Bethany for putting this all together, and really a big thank you to Greg and Beth for agreeing to speak today. We can't really even tell you how excited we are about this webinar series. We've been talking about doing this, and everything has just come together for, for such a time as this to get everything together, and really passionate about linking the faith community uh, with the work we do in recovery to see how the church can really have an impact on this epidemic. Um, our webinar today is entitled Science and the Faith Community, Can We Work Together? And the goal of the webinar is to go over and review opioid use disorder, what they are, and addiction, uh, according to science, and how the faith community can play such a huge role in recovery. We, we truly believe that it is the answer and the, and the help that people are needing, of, but there's so many different resources that people need. How can we understand what those are and be there to meet that need um, as people need it. It is definitely my pleasure to introduce our speakers to you today. I want to do that real quickly and turn it over to them because they have a lot of great information to share. Um, Pastor Greg Delaney serves as the HOPE Director for Reach for Tomorrow Ohio, which is a nonprofit organization uh, where he leads a coordinated effort to educate churches, faith, and community leaders about trauma and human trafficking. Greg is a frequent faith partner um, for former, former Ohio General, Attorney General Mike DeWine's statewide outreach on substance abuse, as well as Attorney General Patrick Morrissey of West Virginia's Combating Addiction with Grace Initiative. Greg also is the current outreach coordinator for statewide alcohol and drug treatment center Woodhaven, Ohio. And Greg is a presenter and contributor to the faith-based recovery efforts of the Center of Faith-Based and Outreach Initiatives in Washington, D.C. He's the founder of the Jeremiah Tree, a Green County, Ohio nonprofit ministry dedicated to community assistance and recovery housing. And Greg is a person in long-term recovery. He has been married to his wonderful wife, Beth, for 30 years. 
And for any of you that know Greg, you know how introducing him can be a challenge because he does so much. <laughs> so there's a lot of credentials to go through there. So we're really honored and thankful to have you here. And in addition, Beth is the same. Uh, Beth is, is honored to serve alongside the nurse faculty at Cedarville University as an associate professor in the University School of Nursing. She's also a family nurse practitioner for focusing in the areas of oncology, cancer survivorship, palliative care, and hospice at the Dayton Physicians Network. Beth partners with Greg to work locally and around the country educating and increasing collaboration among organizations that seek to provide hope and help for those facing addiction and those who are in recovery. She currently serves as the board chairperson for Her Story House. Excuse me. Uh, for the Freedom Recovery Ministry at a House of Prayer in Xenia, Ohio. And she's part of Attorney General David Yost's Opioid Task Force. Beth is a graduate of Wright State University and gained her Doctorate of Nursing Practice degree from The Ohio State University. And together, Be Greg, Beth and Greg have three children and their ministry, for those of you who know it, is wonderful. And as I've said, we are really thrilled to have you all here today. And I'll turn um, it over. Just before you get started, um, we've had a couple of people say they're having some trouble hearing. I, it, hears a, it sounds okay on my end, but just make sure to speak up loud and clearly um, so that everybody can hear you. And when you're talking, um, I think whoever's talking to be directly in front of the camera helps with the sound, so. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, we are excited about uh, sharing this information with you today and uh, in coordination with Relink. And Bethany and Barbara have been such great partners and such um, just wonderful uh, just advocates for the recovery community for a long time. And I even had the pleasure of marrying Bethany. So I, I really have a, a, a deep love and affection for, for both of them. And so we're going to jump into this pretty quickly. We okay, have a lot. Didn't, he didn't marry Bethany. He married, I married me. Right. Uh, he performed the ceremony for Bethany. Thank you. There you go. Okay. We got all the, the today's presenters stuff. Um, you can see we're fairly informal in the way that we approach this stuff. Um, but the objectives for today are really, we want to kind of acknowledge the tension that does sometimes exist between the scientific community and the faith community when it comes to substance use disorder. Um, and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to give you a little feel for kind of the, the, the general sometimes view of, uh, of this tension. Uh, and then we're going to try to present the science in a way that you can, either as a faith leader, I heard a lot of diverse background in, in terms of our attendees today, um, but how you can better communicate either with your faith community or as the faith community with those who are serving those folks that are dealing with substance use disorder, your treatment centers, recovery homes, that sort of thing. And then we're really going to try to help today to advance the acceptance of these two things being able to coexist. And we have some things at the very end, just some very simple, just objectives to think about whether I'm a faith leader or whether I'm in the business of serving uh, folks in substance use disorder that are dealing with that from a clinical perspective or a science perspective. So where does this tension come from? And a lot of times it, it comes from experience versus the science. And I, I got a picture of a golf course there and I, I go back to this idea from that I, I actually, it was a conversation that I had with a, a great guy who was supporting a faith-based ministry here in Ohio. We were in a golf outing together uh, and we got to talking a little bit about what we do. It was the first time I had met him. I didn't know he was a supporter of this particular ministry. And it, over the course of our conversation, it really got down to he didn't believe in any of the science when it came to substance use disorder. Uh, he said, this is something we can pray away. And he had that experience because he had experienced it inside the, the faith community where he was uh, familiar with that particular program. He had seen uh, men be delivered from substance use and didn't need any of this brain science or medication or things like that. And so sometimes that experience creates some tension. And, and this was a quote and, and came from a, a kind of a conversation that we had in Maryland a couple years ago. And it was in conjunction with the partnership center that, that you just heard from a little bit there in my bio. But that some faith communities and recovery housing and treatment centers, you know, view abstinence as preferred and the only route to recovery. And that may preclude using some psychotropic interventions. We're gonna talk really briefly about what, what those could be, 
that's another webinar altogether. But the other side of that coin is SAMHSA, who is our substance abuse and mental health services organization in Washington, D.C. They view the value of faith-based organizations in terms of helping folks recover. So it's imperative that we begin to understand each other a little bit better and recognize, and I'll say it here in a minute, and I'll say it again, I'll say it all the time, that really this can be a both-and conversation rather than an either-or conversation. So this came from Robert Walker, who did a, a study from the university at the University of Kentucky about religion, spirituality, and the science of substance use disorder. And, and one of the conclusions that he had come to is that the history heightens some of the tension, that religious systems have traditionally looked at addictive behaviors through a moral lens. And something that has happened and only rarely been applied to other diseases in the past 200 years, and where he was coming from from that is that we don't take a look at other diseases in the same way that we do substance use disorder inside the faith community uh, as this moral failing. We, we don't look at someone who suffers from diabetes as a moral failing when we watch them eat chocolate. We don't look at it as a moral failing for someone who has heart disease that perhaps isn't following his exercise regimen or not taking his medication. And so some of this tension comes from this idea that substance use is different. It, as a disease, it really is more of a choice, not a disease. And Beth's going to take, take that, that ball and run with it today while we talk. So quickly, is it evidence or experience? Kind of going back to this. And one of the main the goals of the Partnership Center, and Barbara mentioned them, uh, at a federal level, you have a Center for Partnership, a partnership and, and out, out Opportunity Initiatives, and they are doing some fantastic work. They're building toolkits for the faith community to engage this population, both this substance use disorder group, as well as those who, who deal with mental health issues. But this partnership center is out there to address and remediate the crisis. And they are looking for us as liaisons, as faith leaders, as community leaders, to help us become more comfortable with some of the scientific evidence when it is related to substance use disorder. And we're going to talk a little bit about, at the end of that quote, we're saying MAP, and that's medically assisted treatment. And that is one of the interventions that's rooted in the evidence and the science to help folks get better that are dealing with substance use disorder. So at a federal level, you've got some great buy-in and some tools and resources from Shannon Royce, Heidi Christensen, and others on that team that are doing just some magnificent work. And when we send out the materials at the end of today, we will uh, look to include links so there are particular resources so that you can have a look at them because they're very helpful uh, if you're wanting to start to serve this population or if you're looking for ways to better serve this population. Going back to the idea, is it either or, or is it a both and? Do we lean heavy in tradition or do we come, become more client-centric or more person-centered? And the same University of Kentucky study kind of came to this conclusion that in order to build the bridge, we have how to move past this idea that substance use disorder is merely sin in that accusatory or judgmental sense. We need to start looking at it more from the standpoint of what it really is, and Beth will elaborate on that as a disease, as a biopsychosocial and spiritual issue altogether. So really kind of the core of this and why this is important is when Dr. Delaney and I spend our time traveling around, we spend a lot of time on this particular statement. It's always about the why rather than the whatever. Addictive behaviors don't have to be necessarily rooted in opioids or alcohol, which was in my case, or other drugs of abuse. No, I mean, it can be gambling. You can have addictive uh, behavior toward food. You can have it toward pornography. And so often we get so caught up in the whatever we're using to kind of deal with our pain. And the root of most addiction is folks looking to deal with pain, whether that pain is physical, whether that pain is social, whether that pain is emotional. And interestingly enough, in the brain, all of those pains hang out in the same place. And so when we find a substance or we find an activity or we find something that helps to alleviate that pain, and begin to create a compulsion around that, that's where addictive behaviors begin. But unless we go back and deal with the why someone is seeking relief from that pain, then we're really kind of missing an opportunity. And from a faith perspective, we're missing the opportunity to minister because it is in the why that we will have a chance to really spend time relationally with someone, looking to get to know them, looking to try to understand what are the root 
issues that they're suffering from to have them seeking these, these uh, ways to alleviate their pain. So we've had some light bulb moments with faith leaders when we've done this talk. Uh, I've watched it. Folks that have had a real strong you know, view that this is sinful, it's moral, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just bad folks. Uh, and then they hear what Beth's going to tell you a little bit about, and then suddenly the light bulb goes off, and they're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That explains to me a little bit better of why someone is doing what it is that they're doing. So I wanted to kind of show you this little video. This is in support because this particular effort is in conjunction with the Office of Faith-Based and Outreach, Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. We have so many faith-based things. Community initiatives at the state level, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Delaney. So take a look at this from Mr. DeWine. Hello, I'm Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. Thank you so very much for being here. I want to thank each and every one of you for your leadership and your commitment to helping others. Okay, that's what we were a little bit worried about. So he goes on to just really reinforce what I had said about the Partnership Center and what you're seeing from SAMHSA and what you're seeing from other leaders at both federal, state, across the country is that there's a real openness and a willingness to engage the faith community when it comes to this challenge. And so part of the way that we do that effectively is to have this discussion. Science and faith are both and. Can we work together? And we most certainly can. And where we are doing this kind of work together, we are seeing incredible results. And we're seeing people set free from addiction. And we're also seeing communities heal from the challenges of addiction. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Delaney. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about the science, and we'll come back and kind of wrap it up the best we can there at the end. You guys, thank you so much for being here. We're really, really excited for the opportunity. And he's walking away, but he's going to need to come back because if our videos don't work, what I'm going to ask you to do is to be the 30-second summary of the video. Okay, so you come along back here and we'll go. Um, so again, thank you to Dalton, Relink, all of those people. Um, I wanted to let you know that from my lens and my perspective, you heard from Barbara, um, but I have an additional lens that I want to share with you. Why, why do I care about all of this? Well, obviously, I'm married to a person in long-term recovery, but if you were to know some of my personal history, my father suffered from substance use disorder, which unfortunately led to a suicide. Um, I had a half-sister who I didn't know very well, but also struggled with substance abuse and also, unfortunately, uh, committed suicide. I have had dear family and friends, dear family and friends, who um, not only struggle with substance use disorder, but mental health issues. And so understanding and knowing that Greg actually, it took him seven times before he had a long-term time of recovery. That's another reason that I hope and that we hope that when people hear kind of the things that we're trying to share today, that they will link arms with us and share hope to others that they can recover. So um, that's my perspective, and you heard what Barbara had to say about my professional background. So that's the lens for which I bring this material. Now, really, at this point in time, in my life, in my professional and career, and then now with COVID and things happening in our world, I decided every day that what I have control over is to wake up every morning, and for me, looking through a Christian lens is love God and love others. And we're gonna come back to that in just a minute, but I know that I can do that every day and hopefully that brings hope to someone else when I'm loving others. So as a doctor of nursing practice, um, I'm also very, very interested and committed to what science has to tell us. And when I do presentations, I like to not only provide you with information during the presentation, but I'm hopeful, like Greg said, with the Partnership Center and so many offices and Relink, but that you'll take a trip back here and look at some of the resources that we've outlined for you today because they can be helpful to you as you serve others in the future. So these different organizations, and I'm gonna move us for just a minute, Greg, over here. SAMHSA, Ohio um, uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services, the National Institute on Drug Abuse are all great places that you might find further science information. Now, the last thing I wanna do is talk to you about an educational theory that I think is helpful and relevant to the next few minutes of our conversation and content. It's called the community of inquiry. So when I'm a professor and I'm teaching, especially adult online learners, this theory is helpful to me 
because it says a community of inquiry is an educational community of inquiry, a group of individuals who collaboratively engage in purposeful, critical discourse and reflection to construct personal meaning, not only, you know, what am I learning and what am I meaning and understanding from the material, but also to confirm mutual understanding. And what I've learned in conversation and all the different groups and experiences that we've had is trying to really focus on understanding the person and what they're trying to get across in your conversation is really important, but not something that we intuitively do because we're always usually interested in what am I going to say or what am I going to happen next and that's not right. Or defend and put ourselves in this win-lose situation in a conversation when it doesn't have to be that way. You can seek understanding and which is what I'm hoping that you'll do in this time that we have these few minutes that we have together today. So let's start at the beginning when it comes to the science part. The National Institute on Drug Abuse defines addiction as a chronic relapsing disorder characterized by compulsive drug seeking, alcohol seeking, pornography seeking, use despite adverse consequences. It is considered a brain disorder because it involves functional changes to brain circuits involved in reward, stress, and self-control. These changes may last a long time after a person has stopped taking, in this particular instance or example, drugs. Okay, I got to move over here. And the American Society of Addiction Medicine says that addiction is a treatable, chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continued despite harmful consequences, which is what we're going to talk about today. Now, I said to you earlier at the beginning of when I uh, just joined this webinar that I decided that I could every day love God and love others. Well, there's more to that little piece of story. Two years ago, after Greg and I had been traveling and speaking to groups, we started really to come more and, and honestly, from a Christian perspective, I felt like, hmm, I wonder what the Bible has to say about you know, kind of a holistic approach to looking at substance use disorder. But me as a provider and a nurse practitioner, I look at people not only with what's going on physically, but what's going on emotionally, what's going on spiritually, what's going on in their support system, because that helps me to help them decide how they might feel better. Well, I kind of delved into um, the Bible and I found that if you look at the greatest commandment um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, what does he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, or with all your soul, or with all your spirit, depending upon which translation you read. But I was like, oh, Eureka, you mean Jesus and the greatest commandment says that there's three parts to a person, which I was like, huh, translate pretty well into me as a healthcare provider thinking about a holistic approach. So much that in the science world, Georgetown University, well-respected, not only for the medical and health care that, that they provide, but all of the wonderful academic things that they do. They actually have a Body, Mind, Spirit Institute that you could check out. Studies have shown that spirituality and religion can play a role in how an individual adult or a child copes with being sick. So again, we hope that today you'll at least ponder both together and how we can help people. And this bottom bullet says to us, don't forget, it's only been over the last 100, maybe 100 to 200 years where spirituality was an integral part of health and healing and care for one another. So I think we've got the idea that the first part of this webinar, we're going to try to identify to you why we might think about substance use disorder with four facets, biological, psychological, sociological, and spiritual. Now, if this video doesn't work, I'm going to have video man come in and tell you, but before I hit this video, which would be pretty short, it's another resource. So if you've checked out, but hopefully you have a piece of paper and something to write down with, this would be another great resource for you. It's called the Addiction Policy Forum. The Addiction Policy Forum is a nonprofit organization that tries to advocate for people with those with substance use disorders and their families. They have created this short easy to understand video series, which goes over different types of concepts associated with addiction. The first one's called the hijacker. So I use, and Greg uses the addiction policy form videos 
to show maybe when you're talking to a group like this or when you're working with an individual family. And this furthers to spur conversation. So I'm really hoping this works, but it's a 50-50. Scientists first began to understand addiction as a brain disorder in the 1950s. Doctors Olds and Milner, in laboratory studies of rats, found the parts of the brain affected by addiction. But then in 1994, doctors Volkov and Shelbert, top neuroscientists, ran CAT scans of the brain that showed the effects of substance use disorders. Like other diseases, these scans showed it affected tissue function. There are two main parts of the brain affected by drug use, the limbic system and the cortex. The limbic system, located deep within the brain, is responsible for our basic survival instincts. So when you do essential things to stay alive, like eat, drink, find shelter, have sex, or care for your young, your brain reinforces behaviors that cause the release of dopamine from this region. That reward for surviving is also transmitted to the amygdala and hippocampus, which records a memory of that feeling, so we seek it again. This is our survival hardwiring. Addiction also affects this area up here in the prefrontal cortex, which is what separates us from other animals. This is where decision-making and impulse control live. When drugs or alcohol are used, they activate the same dopamine process in the survival center. And when use is repeated, that substance can hijack that part of the brain. This hijacker changes the brain and weakens this system to make it believe that the primary need for survival is the drug. In hijacking the brain, it can usurp those primary motivations food, water, shelter, sex, and protecting our young. And the hijacker needs more and more of the substance to activate the same level of reward or feeling of pleasure, causing the brain tissue to become increasingly damaged with continued drug use. There are factors that put you at higher risk for the hijacker, including individual factors like genes and age of first use, and then environmental factors like drug availability. But if the hijacker takes hold, addiction is treatable. Advancements have been made in assessments, detox, treatment programs, recovery supports, and medications to treat addiction. Brain scans show that once in recovery, the tissue in the limbic system and cortex can get better. With your help, we can expand these innovations to help millions of individuals and families and ensure that addiction is treated as the medical issue that it is. Together, we can solve this. Join us. So you'll see why I like those, that video series. So quick review, what we've learned so far, according to our science friends, is that substance use disorder is a brain disease. It has biological, psychological, sociological, and spiritual components. Prevention is possible. Treatment can be effective and recovery can be possible and sustainable. So let's talk just a moment. I'm gonna take just a little bit from that video. I'm gonna kind of give it a little bit more information around it so you can understand it. And then I think we're gonna skip one of the videos just so that we can have more time to talk. Um, so neurotransmitters. So remember what the video said. Actually, when a person has a normal healthy brain, we have neurotransmitters in our brain. I call it brain grease. It's just like brain grease. And the brain grease helps the brain work. And the grease helps send the messages back and forth over to all parts of the brain and eventually out of the brain, out onto our, our muscles and our nerves and our senses so that we can interact in the world that we find ourselves in. So a neurotransmitter is a chemical substance released at the end of the nerves, the tiny little parts of the brain. There are different types of, of neurotransmitters or brain grease that do different things in the brain. Dopamine, norepinephrine, noradrenaline, epinephrine, histamine, serotonin. These are just names of different types of neurotransmitters that you might uh, come across in your human body. Now, I'm going to skip this video so we'll have more time for conversation. But we can post this out. It's called Two Minute Neuroscience. The authors do a great job 
of really highlighting what I wanted you to see is just the high complexity of what happens in our brain and that how wonderfully it was created, but also that frontal cortex, that front part of the brain is where decision-making happens. And so oftentimes that front part or that decision-making perspective could be changed with substance use disorder. Okay, let's go on. Oh, baby. Oh, we go. Okay, so remember back from the video, when your brain is working well, you have neurotransmitters that transmit messages. And when you engage with good food, when you have sex, when you're having something exciting or wonderful happening, when you're experiencing comfort or that warm, snuggly blanket, not in July, um, you have neurotransmitters that go off and they go, oh, this is pleasurable, this is good. Dopamine is one of those neurotransmitters. And here's part of the issue. Dopamine gets increased in your brain or it surges during that pleasure experience. Also, those substances can start to mimic some of those neurotransmitters. So remembering that pleasure is a powerful biological force for survival, that if you do something pleasurable, the brain is wired in such a way that you want to do it again to have that surge of pleasure. So, as I just mentioned, sometimes substances or actions or behaviors mimic a little bit what a natural neurotransmitter would do when a regular type of pleasure or survival behavior is necessary. Now, you don't have to be a healthcare provider to understand that there are differences in these two pictures. So this is a picture of a head scan of a brain and the brain is healthy. So you can see all the colors that are associated with the healthy brain. However, this is a person who has used cocaine for a period of time. And if you can't recognize anything else, you can recognize that there are two different colors of that brain scan, which demonstrate that the brain actually physically changes when a person has used substances for a period of time. This is a really great short one minute and a half video and I hope it works. If it doesn't, we'll keep going. I'm Thomas Ross. I'm a staff scientist in the neuroimaging research branch at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So our branch uses brain imaging techniques to investigate uh, issues in drug abuse. Principally, we use a, a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging. We do it in a way that's sensitive to changes in blood flow. So you can imagine that if part of your brain is working harder, then it will need more oxygen. So there'll be a local increase in blood flow. And we can set up our MRI machine so that's sensitive to those local changes in blood flow. It shows us what parts of the brain are needed to do certain things. Maybe if I asked you to make a risky decision, I might want to know what part of your brain changes during that risky decision, and maybe that differs between a drug user and a non-drug user. And we will create an image where the color of, of the image is related to how big the blood flow changes. As we take these images across time, these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images, and combine them to make a single image that represents changes related to whatever we're looking at. So when you see these images of colorful, uh, we call them clusters or blobs, region of activation overlaid on top of a brain, those colors represent how big the signal change was. So we hope to better inform the scientific community what parts of the brain are important and critical in drug abuse so that they could be targets for either some sort of behavioral therapy or some sort of pharmacotherapy to help end drug abuse. As we move to the last part of the content for today, there are two big, really, topics left that we're going to cover really quickly. So you can imagine one of the questions that Greg alluded to as we travel around is, what really is behind that substance use disorder? Is it a disease or they chose, they chose to start using that substances. So the consequences are theirs to own. And that could be true. 
most of the time it does start with some type of choice, but I would propose two situations for you to ponder. First, how about when you were 14 years old and you were around your friends and they're like, oh, come on, try this, do this, say this to your mom. Were you always making an informed choice that understood the full risk and benefits and implications for years and years down the road? Mm, I don't know. I would say I would not have said that I understood the full implication of that. And why that's so relevant to adolescents is if you talk to our friends in science prevention world, they would tell you that the number one most researched effective strategy for preventing substance use disorder is about delaying the first use. So that's one thing we can help with, delaying that first use with lots of different strategies. And we, again, that's another whole webinar we could talk about prevention strategies at another time. The other scenario I would really ask for you to consider comes from our experience working with people who have substance use disorder. And more times than I'd like to discuss, and it makes my heart very sad, we learn of people who were first exposed, that first exposure to a substance use disorder or a substance when they were children of their parents who were struggling with substances themselves. Therefore, the parent used the substance on or with or to the child. Case in point, and this is a very sad case, but this is our friend still today. Um, a mom was in heroin addiction, trying to figure out her life and the way that she would help her toddler be quiet during a prostitutional transaction would be she would give her heroin. I would say to you that that two-year-old toddler did not make a choice to start using a substance. So these are two scenarios that I think when I came across them, I thought, hmm, I need to think more about that. So if it is or isn't a choice or how does that happen or what your thoughts are, there are certainly some scientific things that describe risk factors for substance use disorder. And so the Addiction Policy Forum tells us a little bit about that in this particular short video. Not everyone who uses alcohol or drugs will develop a problem, yet others will develop a substance use disorder. Why is that? People have different risk factors for developing a substance use disorder that are entirely unique to them. These risk factors could be from your environment, like poverty or if you're exposed to trauma, or more individual risk factors like your genes or the age of first use. The escalation from first use to developing a substance use disorder follows a pathway. This starts with initiation, to regular use, to problem and risky use, and then to substance use disorder and addiction. But not everyone goes down the full path. Think of it like a whirlpool. You start with initiation, dipping your toe into the larger pool. Your risk factors can act as weights, pulling you deeper into the pool, dragging you under the water. Far more people get into the pool with alcohol and tobacco than with heroin or cocaine. Each substance has different risk levels for developing a substance use disorder, like whirlpools swirling at vastly different speeds. The heroin pool, for example, is a powerful force. Over 70% of heroin users will develop a substance use disorder. They'll be sucked in and pulled down, often quickly. Of all tobacco users, 56% will develop a tobacco use disorder. 9% of those who use alcohol, 11% of those who use marijuana, and 51% of those who use methamphetamines. And when multiple substances are used at the same time, the risks get even higher. Drugs and alcohol use can escalate to a disorder rapidly or slowly based on a person's individual risk factors, as well as the risk of the substances they're using. Understanding these risks are vital to understanding how to avoid a substance use disorder. We envision a world where fewer lives are lost to this treatable disease, and help exists for those who need it. Together, we can solve this. Join us. Again, the Addiction, Addiction Policy Forum. Now, one of the things that they talked about in that whirlpools of risk, I wanna highlight because number one, I've helped you understand hopefully today that age of onset is an important thing 
for first use and substance use disorder prevention. But we're learning more and more about the impact in science and the impact of childhood trauma, or you might have called the, heard them called adverse childhood experiences, or sometimes they're referred to as ACEs. So particularly when your adverse childhood experience is uh, associated with a violent act or a sexual act, that really can be a risk factor for you for substance use disorder. The last thing that I wanted to share with you today that might prove to give you some more insight is to help you understand one of the last themes that Greg and I have come across in our journey and our travels. And that is when families and faith groups and people who don't understand more about substance use disorder believe that communication strategies that happen easily with a healthy person would work equally and effectively with those suffering substance use disorder. Now you might have seen this commercial and let's see if uh, it rings a bell. Hey buddy. Looking good. You know what we gotta do, right? Yeah. You already made a decision, James. It's too late to go back on it. Who's in charge here? Let's go. Come on. Come on! Let's go! Everyone's waiting for you. No, it's not what I'm doing. It's not what I'm talking about. Just, I don't know if it's the best. Like disappointing your friends, James? You don't want to disappoint everybody, do you? Are you a disappointment, James? You're a good driver. But that, that's Let's not... Get in the car. No. Get in the car. I don't think I, I should do this. The reason that I wanted to share that video is because clearly the person in the mirror is not looking the same as the person at the sink. And there's two dialogues going on. And we as a healthy person are used to communication with maybe a person who doesn't have a substance use disorder. We are communicating with a person that we think we see in the mirror. But the person who's suffering from substance use disorder or maybe even another mental health issue believes that they look different than what you might be seeing. Therefore, things like, why are you spending our money again? Why are you, how can you drive again when you are like looking so bad? They don't see it that way. They see things as, they're getting over, you're, you're not figuring, they're using. So I'm telling you, their perception of communication is disorder don't translate when speaking to those who might be suffering, particularly if they are in a time when they're using the substance. Now, let's summarize. There are three C's of addiction that I think make sense. First, there's the control part. Early recreational use, eventually then they keep using more regularly, there's a loss of emotional and behavior control. Then the brain starts to have those physical changes. And what they think you are seeing and what they think about is happening might be different than what you see and are thinking. Then if they were to stop using their substance, they would experience symptoms of withdrawal, which then we know that physically is probably a problem. That control, when that substance is starting to gain control over them, then turns into a compulsion where they are seeking activities, craving the addiction, because why? their brain has been hijacked, just as described in the hijacker video. So those normal neurotransmitters be replaced by substance use, the substances, and the pleasure response becomes the priority. So back to driving with your kids in the car when you're wasted makes perfect sense to them. And it doesn't matter that they've lost their house in a bankruptcy the priority is the substance and that compulsion then turns into chronicity and then it doesn't matter what's happening with consequences whether it be jail or DUI or anything like that their brain has changed and therefore their priorities have changed and therefore they make decisions a little bit differently and at this point in time 
regular communication that you might use might not work the same. So Greg mentioned that I think as we talk about the way to recovery, I like to, to think about it in a way that is holistic, as I said before, but if you think about it as a physical thing, an emotional thing, a spiritual thing, and then combine those all together as a community, the medically assisted treatment part is about the physical part. Medically assisted treatment is approved by the Food and Drug Administration. It's not just something out there. There are different types of therapies in combination with counseling, behavioral therapies, and I would say spiritual intervention. They work together to provide a holistic or a whole patient approach to treatment of substance use disorders. Now this time, our time today doesn't allow us to go into a different specific types of medical treatment. But what I would suggest is that it's one lane to recovery. So if you think about an old dirt road and you stay on the physical piece, there's the old dirt road and you probably will get there because the old dirt road will eventually lead somewhere. But what if you thought about the physical part and you got the medication that helped and we got you some counseling and behavioral things to help you with the why behind the whatever. And then you can have a faith community that will come alongside and help support you in a community in spiritual ways and praying and healing. That I would say is a three lane highway or the super highway to recovery. Now, so is it science? Is it spiritual or is it both? The last thing, if you want more, or I've just, we've just whetted your appetite. Because again, it's just about what our journey has taken us on. We're hoping that we've given you a taste of what can happen. But if you're really into that brain thing, neuroplasticity is a concept for you. Neurochemicals are exchanged from brain cell to brain cell via an axon. So that's the little cell there. That's part of that, where the neurotransmitters go. Substance abuse can lead to depletion of the chemicals resulting in a chemical imbalance. They result chemical imbalances, mental illnesses, and addictive behaviors because the brain can restore it. To, okay, read that again. The brain, uh oh, and you heard our dog, sorry. The brain can restore itself. If nothing interrupts the transfer of the neurochemicals, people can get better. And that is a Romans 12 type of brain, which we're all designed with. So if you want to look more, there is a neuroscientist, Dr. Caroline Leaf, who looks at a theory of neuroplasticity, meaning that bad changes in the brain, good changes in the brain, and the Romans 12, two changes in the brain, let God change you from the inside out with a new way of thinking. You could check her out. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Greg. Come on back, dude. Well, thank you, Dr. D. Um, so hopefully, as Beth said, you've got a little snippet of this. And and to her point, we will send out every link. Uh, our friends at the Addiction Policy Forum are not just there in D.C. Their founder actually sits with me on Recovery Ohio, and we report to the governor of Ohio. So she's, a, she's an amazing advocate, as Beth said. But at the same time, her organization continues to provide relevant, simple information that can be shared with communities that may not have a complete understanding or maybe don't know as much as you might know when it comes to substance use disorder. I, kind of wanted, I wanted to circle back and just reinforce this idea of us doing this together, science and spiritual, science and faith. Can we both get along? Can we do this together? And the thing is, is we have incredible buy-in at high levels here in the United States. The Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary Azer, has made that statement that you see on, on, on the slide there, that, that he sees that we've taken a leading role in our compassionate approach to, um, to this particular issue. And, um, and he wants our support. He's eager to, to have us be a part of the support network. And I really like what Tony Evans says. Uh, he he kind of sums it up. Sometimes we'll lean so heavily on just the government of this thing. Um, and they can fund our programs and they can provide things like SAMHSA and others to, to help guide and direct us, but can't love the way we love. And, and they're not designed to do that. And so our time, our faith is designed to have social implication. And so, so our spiritual side and our social side must be connected. And I would say that flows into the science piece too. So to kind of wrap it all up here for you today, it can, and what we're talking about does work. 
And there are some simple things to just kind of think about of how do I mix these two things together? And when our scientific and faith-based approaches work compatibly, this is what we get, but we have to kind of start here. It's when the faith-based approach takes brain and physio physiological differences into account when assessing the person who is addicted. Beth walked you through that. That person in the video in the bathroom, it's different. So I have to take into account what they're experiencing and what's going on with them. When the faith-based approach focuses on first being what I call pastoral, rather than preachy. Far too often as faith communities, we want to lead with uh, smacking somebody in the head with the King James Bible and tell them to get better. And we recognize that that's not a, an, a, a good approach at all. And when we can approach it more pastorally with an understanding of what it is that they're suffering from, rather than being preachy, it can work. And when the faith-based approach listens and learns and then leans into all of the options that are available to them within the recovery community. And that requires some legwork on the part of the faith community. One of the amazing things that relink.org has done is they've given you a database, an accessible look at all of those amazing resources that you can go filter and bring down and find where those partners are around you that can be a part of the equation to help somebody. The last two are when science understands so we also lean on the treatment center folks to, to recognize our value as faith-based leaders that we have a recovery support that is unparalleled. And when that recovery support has knowledge and understanding of what the individuals are dealing with and the community around them that can help support, then we only strengthen the opportunity for someone that enters into that community of assistance to get better. And then the last one there, um, when both are willing to be person-centric. And what does that mean? We have to get away in our language of calling them junkies and, you know, alcoholic and drug addicts. And remember, these are people, people who are dealing with a substance use disorder, dealing with the challenge. And so when we do that, we have to recognize that we are opportunity brokers for their healing. And so when we go over here and say it's got to be faith or it's got to be science, we're sitting there in that either or platform, we're not operating collaboratively. And we can be better opportunity brokers for healing for folks when we are collaborative and not competitive. And there's an entire webinar that we do talking about how a faith community can enter into collaboration within their community to be a part of the holistic process of recovery for someone. So that kind of like finishes it up for us. We've got a few minutes for questions. I don't know how the chat's gone. I haven't been watching. Um, but if you got any questions for us, Bethany, throw at us. Yeah, so um, there's a few key questions that I just want to address. And because, um, you know, there's there's such a difference kind of in that percentage around opioid use. I um, mean, when people use that and their likelihood to, um, you know, become addicted, I was wondering if you could speak on kind of just briefly um, what are some of those key things that make that different um, when it comes to opioid use? Well, I, I think from the, the, the perspective that we have, opioids in general really, really crank that pleasure center in a different way than other drugs do. And so, you know, it, and it's kind of interesting what opioids end up doing. They, they end up really dealing with the pain. And, and often, you know, you could get started on an opioid because you had a physical injury and then if you've got some things you're dealing with mentally, it'll actually help with that. And so the addictive nature, the way that it affects the brain is a little bit different. What we're seeing in Ohio right now and probably seeing across the country is something that we're calling polysubstance abuse. 92% of the overdoses that happened in the county that I'm right next to in Montgomery County last year, I think maybe even in the state, were polysubstance related. And so the idea that someone is strictly an opioid user these days is not as common as it might have been in 2017, 2016. We're seeing folks who are having a combination of things that are impacting their substance use, maybe with crystal methamphetamine that's mixed with fentanyl. Maybe that, uh, and, and those drugs of abuse that typically weren't included, like cocaine, like marijuana, we're actually seeing fentanyl start to be put in there. And fentanyl is a very highly addictive and highly powerful opioid. So I think that would set, get up something there. And yeah, and Bethany also, because opioids oftentimes are prescribed by healthcare providers, um, they're thought of as a little more safe because my doctor wouldn't give me anything to hurt me. And therefore, oftentimes just having the substance, the opioids in the house 
believe it or not, other people try to start using them and they may using them in different ways, obviously not prescribed. So I think part of the issue also is people are a little less afraid because their healthcare provider prescribed it to them. And there is just because the opioids are in the house, other people might have accessibility to them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we talked a lot about kind of the other factors that, it, and you know, how this is a disease um, and what causes some people to get into addiction. Can you talk about what the individual responsibility is um, in finding recovery? Well, I think, uh, and I'll, I'll speak anecdotally from my own journey. Um, you know, there, there is for everyone, I think, a catalytic moment of when they want, they want to get better. Um, you know, either you're in the process of getting better or you're in the process of getting, getting dead. That, that's just kind of the nature and, and just the reality. And so in my own particular, you know, situation, I was pressed into trying to get better because I was suffering in the hospital. But for others, there can be all kinds of ways that they have to take that personal responsibility. So whether you're part of a 12 step kind of, you know, tradition where it says, I have to kind of come to that conclusion that my life is unmanageable. I have to kind of get to that place because I still have, I still have to sort of drive my journey of recovery. Now, what we do want to see is that when that statement is made or when that realization is made, and that could happen you know, in the back of a cruiser, that could happen at a hospital, that could happen at the altar in your church, that that community that we've talked about is there to come along and support effectively so that I can help you, okay, let's build on that decision. Let's build on that change of mind. Let's build on that change of, of perspective so that we can now start to usher you through with those resources that we talked about and an understanding of what it is that you're dealing with and with great patience and compassion without enablement is one thing we talked about, and we can help and help you on your journey to get better. That that's how things work for me. I don't know. Which also, and I'm so sorry about our dog, um, but it also goes alongside with anybody being responsible for their health. So it's true about all the things that Greg said, but isn't that also true about eating better and drinking better and exercising? All I'm saying is. We all have a personal responsibility to take care of ourselves and to be as healthy as we can, whatever journey we are on. So singling it out sometimes as it's different in a different way, definitely they have to take responsibility and there's consequences. You have to own up to the consequences. I don't know if you want to mention that for just a second. <laughs> no, no, I mean, because the consequences are real. And sometimes they're not just physical. I mean, Beth mentioned, I mean, we lost everything we own. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and I still suffer from some things physically now, but hopefully that gives you a feel. But I think what Beth said is really important from this perspective, that one of the things that we really want to try to do is eliminate the stigma, like we talked about at the very beginning, that this is unique, you know, from diabetes, or this is unique from other kinds of chronic health issues. It's not. And those same levels of responsibility, those same levels of engagement, those same levels of, of uh, seeking intervention are the same. And, and we kind of push it over here and make it moral, or we push it over here and make it different, or we push it over here and say we're bad, then we're not, we're not helping the narrative and all we're doing is adding to the stigma. And as we add to the stigma, we build the either or and we eliminate the bridge of the both and between these two things and, and allowing folks to feel that they can comfortably come and seek assistance without all of that baggage to saying that, oh, there's the stigma of what I am and nobody wants to help. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. So there's a couple other questions, but um, I'll make sure that we get those questions answered in the follow-up. Um, so I'll send those to you, Greg and Beth. Um, I just want to, um, oh, it looks like they jumped off. Um, so just so that everybody has kind of a follow-up on some next steps. Um, I wanted to thank you all so much for joining us today and um, some next steps to this webinar. Once you close out, it will open up a post webinar survey that really helps us as we move forward in this series to understand uh, if this is beneficial and what we can do better. Um, another next step that we'll be continuing to talk about throughout the series is um, joining our Facebook group 
which I actually need to make live. So that will be live uh, here shortly once we get off of this webinar. But um, I will also send it in the follow-up, a link to join. It's called Ohio's Faith and Recovery. And that is kind of a great space that we're trying to create for ongoing discussion, sharing strategies and hope and insights across the state um, on how to address opioid use as a faith community. Um, so watch for that follow-up email and please register for the next webinar, which is on August 12th. We'll be talking about harm reduction and stigma and how to address that. Um, and just for a reminder, the rest of the series, some other topics we'll be talking about is how to get uh, involved on the local level, um, how to reach out and collaborate, and also just kind of talking about COVID-19 and how that's impacting the recovery community and what we can do right now. If anybody has any questions, please reach out to me at bfriedrichson at relink.org. And uh, I'll be following up with you all later this week. So thank you all so, so much. This was incredible. Um, and we hope to see you again on the 12th. Have a great day, everyone.